Good evening and welcome to the second in the series of teach-ins. Uh, we had to postpone uh, yesterday's teach-in because of the massive march in which all of us participated. It was a huge and unexpectedly huge success. So uh, I'm glad we were part of that. So we have pushed back our lecture series by one day. Today we will be addressed by Professor Ari Sitas of the University of Cape Town, South Africa. I request my uh, colleague, uh, Sucheta Mahajan, to introduce him. But just before that, I would like to say that the response to the teaching has been overwhelming. I, we have received not only excellent coverage of the first lecture delivered by Professor Gopal Guru, but I have received innumerable emails from teachers all over the country who are willing to participate in this teaching. They have requested us to allow them to come and address you as part of this teaching. I think it's been a wonderful success. And uh, if we have the time and the resources, we would certainly welcome teachers from other universities to come and join us in this extraordinary movement. There has been also, I should report, a teaching at Trivandrum, uh, of which I'm getting more news, and I will be able to report more a little later. But I request now my colleague, Professor Sucheta Mahajan, to introduce the speaker, Professor Ari Sita. Uh, dosto. मैं चाहती हूं कि मैं एक फॉर्मल इंट्रोडक्शन के बजाय सबसे पहले हम उनका तालियों के साथ उनको हम वेलकम करें प्रोफेसर आरिसिकास भारत के दोस्त गांधी के दोस्त मंडेला के दोस्त और भगत सिंह के दोस्त हमारे यहां बहुत गर्व से मैं ये कह रही हूं कि सेंटर फॉर हिस्टोरिकल स्टडीज में हमारे यहां भगत सिंह चेयर है और ये भगत सिंह चेयर में हमारे विजिटिंग प्रोफेसर हैं हमारे साथ आरिसितास एक सेमेस्टर के लिए आए हैं और देखिए कितनी आयरनी कितनी विडंबना की बात है ये कि जो कोर्स वो पढ़ा रहे हैं मेरे साथ वो कोर्स का नाम है हिस्ट्रीज एंड थियरीज ऑफ नेशनलिज्म तो ये हिस्ट्रीज और थियरीज ऑफ नेशनलिज्म जो कोर्स है जिसमें वो साउथ अफ्रीका और अफ्रीका के बारे में क्लास ले रहे हैं आज के अलावा आरिसितास जेनियू के स्टूडेंट्स और टीचर्स के लिए बहुत जाने हुए नाम हैं इनको आपने देखा होगा पिछले 2000 से यहाँ से आ रहे हैं सोशियोलॉजिस्ट हैं कवि हैं, एक्टिविस्ट हैं, बहुत मुश्किल है और मतलब बहुत सी चीजें इनके बारे में कही जा सकती हैं। मंडेला के साथ, उनकी मूवमेंट के साथ इन्होंने बहुत काम किया है। He is a cultural activist. He has been involved in the theatre movement. He has been involved in people's culture and what is very, very interesting for us is that in the last few years, along with Sumangala Madha Modaran, as you know, she is the daughter of, granddaughter of EMS Nambudripad, he has been working uh, in collaboration with her on uh, musical projects where they have been performing both in South Africa and this year they plan to have a project, a performance uh, called Oratario, which they intend to have a performance in India. This is on violence and the contemporary situation today. So let me again, as I said, I'm not introducing him. He doesn't need any introduction. He's, uh, let me welcome him here today. And uh, as a friend of JNU, as a friend of India, and he's going to talk about South Africa and India today. Ari. Thank you, Gyabonga, as we say. I am honored to be here in this Freedom Square. I am honored to be I'm honored to be here because you have shown an incredible self-restraint. It's amazing what you've achieved in the last week. But my role here is as a teacher and I will start my talk by saying in the history of colonialism there emerged a, a family of anti-colonial movements that sought national independence 
or show, uh, sought national liberation. And you were the first to achieve independence. And South Africa was the last in that family to achieve enfranchisement in 1994. The problem is that we are totally intricately connected. You sent that lawyer dressed in dark suit in Durban in the, 18, in the 19th, late 19th century, and you had sent him as a Mohandras, and we sent him back to you as a Mahatma. So, and he started using the word Congress there, 1894, there was the formation of the Natal Indian Congress. And then, after the intransigence of the colonial powers, African leaders started calling themselves the South African Native Congress and formed the African National Congress in 1912. So this idea of Congress somehow goes down the years. But in a sense, because of the large Indian community in South Africa, because of the history of indenture, because indenture came in to replace slave labor, because of the millions now, by now, Indians in South Africa, the story of India has always been close to us. And I spent 27 years in Durban of my teaching life, and I have followed India very closely. Now, nationalism starts in the colonies from two sources, I'd say. The first one is an idea of a response, okay? It's a response to the colonial powers and that says, eh, 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 eh. hey, hey, we also come from a long way back and you can't treat us like this, collectively or individually. It's this response, nah, nada, stop it, okay? All national movements start from that response. Enough. We don't want it. And then, of course, because colonial powers have been so crazy in drawing boundaries and maps and, you know, using rulers and just dividing countries and putting people together and so on. And in Africa, remember, in the 1880s, they all sat together in Berlin and they took out their rulers and they divided Africa up and then they colonized it up to that line each one. So, in a sense, it has to become not only a uh -uh, stop it, a response, it also has to be a work of the imagination. How do we bring all these people together who are being brought together through colonial rule in their differences, in their complexities, in their cultures, in their religions, into a movement now that will create the new. So, in other words, the anti-colonial movements are a response, but also a kind of a work of the imagination to imagine the as not yet, that future, whatever we call it, azadi, future, nkululeko, something like that. And then the hard work starts. But if we want to understand that, hey, stop it, no, no, away. And this work of the imagination we have to seriously study the history of how European powers started foraging up and down the coastlines. And you know what foraging is, huh? The beginning is, well, I want your shoes. Oh, nice shoes. Can I have your shoes, please? Yeah. And you start grabbing, taking, bartering, trading, and this foraging, in a sense, then moves towards settlement. Okay, I'll sit next to you, but I'll still take your shoes. I like your shoes. <laughs> so, settlement starts. And settlement starts creating these conditions of the other. All of a sudden, you are an other in the place where you were standing yesterday. All of a sudden, you are other. And can you imagine them looking for India in the wrong way? and calling all those people, those others, Indians. Okay, generic term, it didn't matter where they came from, what their polities were and so on, Indians. 
You know, and then they got John Wayne in the movies to shoot them. Sorry, it's an aside. Um, settlement. And then from settlement starts, from this othering, starts colonization. During the settlement, it was necessary because you needed the slave trade. You needed the trade in ivory. You needed the trade in gold. You had to settle some people there. And of course, countries were overpopulating over there in the north. And some settlers started coming in. But by no means it was colonization. And we shared with you the British East India Company, and you didn't have the joy of having the Dutch East India Company in your, uh, all over the place, but they came here as well. So, but then, all of a sudden, the process of colonization starts. And that process creates the sense of governance, the sense of rules, the sense of regulations, the inclusions and exclusions, the classifications and the codes, of what it needs to be done in order for these others, you, me, and so on and so forth, to be othered and to be made to learn obedience and admire the civilizational mission that was imposed on us. So that is basically only a deep study of these processes of colonization that will allow us to understand why nationalisms in the colonies differ from nationalisms from other places that have not been colonized. Now, of course, the British had a torrid time in India, poor chaps. But anyway, they managed from British East India Company to assume total control of India, and they had to get a sense of this difference, classify people, measure their heads, put them away, and so on until finally they had a sense of control and colonial rule could be established and they admitted it was diverse, it was complex and they enjoyed a lot of the nizams and their wealth and all those things that were happening and they enjoyed particularly diamonds and gold, the British did. They enjoyed it very much. And to the misfortune of South Africa or Southern Africa, diamonds and gold were in abundance. Okay, the story of colonization and real control of the Southern African territory starts with the so-called discovery of diamonds, and then afterwards the so-called discovery of gold. And there you see a rush of all kinds of people trying to get benefit out of the situation. You see tensions escalating between the Boers and the Britons. You see the emergence of people like Cecil John Rhodes. I'm sure you've heard of a Rhodes Must Fall movement in South Africa. Yeah. Cecil John Rhodes who takes control of the diamond fields and establishes systems and then moves on to the gold fields. And before you know it, after the war, the Boer War, sorry, but the Britons fight the Boers and they come together, decide, let's have a union of South Africa, and they decide on the rules of the union, and they exclude 75% of the population from that union of South Africa. So it is very important to understand, in terms of the South African story, this process of colonization, discovery of gold, and then creating the labor forces to dig that gold, creating the migrant labor system to dig out that gold, and to see the Union of South Africa emerging as a state and then the majority to be excluded. It was a quick process. 1874, you put natives in reserves. That's 13% of the land. Natives then have to be tribes. They can't be all polities or anything. They're tribes and they have to be ruled by customary rule and therefore they have to have their homeland kind of thing, and then it's the reserves, that's where they go, the reserves. 1886, you create the pass laws. No native can move out of the reserves without carrying a pass. If you do, oops, into jail. And why? To regulate the migrant labor system to dig out uh, the gold. You needed the labor, but you needed to exclude it at the same time. 
So 1886, that happens, then of course they find out that Zulu people and Kosa people are not very interested in digging gold at three kilometers underground. So therefore you create the poll tax in 1906, which compels every household to pay taxes in cash, and therefore somebody has to work. Okay, and you start getting, by 1906, a regular stream of labor. And by 1913, you have the Land Act that demarcates what is private property for whites and what is reserve land for blacks. And whoever is in the way, off to the reserves, 1913. By 1923, you have the Urban Areas Act that says nobody can be here who is black in the cities and by right, only by exemption. And you have all kinds of exemptions for some people to be in the cities, but never permanently. Nine-year leases, 99-year leases, and so on. And the majority is supposed to be tribal and in the reserves. So that is, in a sense, how the story starts. And then, to cap it all, 1924, you have the Industrial Conciliation Act that defines Africans as non-employees. And therefore, even if they organize trade unions and movements, they won't be recognized. There's no compulsion to recognize them. So, native rule, what I'm trying to say, the creation of the native in Southern Africa is all about that. So, at the same time, what I'm trying to say is that the natives in general, but tribes in particular, and that's how indirect rule is imposed, and they did it because why? Because they said they learned the lessons. Mr. Lugard le learned his lessons in India and therefore wouldn't do the mistakes that they did in India. Therefore, you need this regulated and regular system of control. So there you have native rule. And then, of course, you've got other problems. You have to separate all kinds of other colors. And you take all those poor people who were liberated as slaves by then because the slave trade was abolished, that came from Malabar, that came from Malaysia, that came from Indonesia, that came from East Africa, and they were working on the vineyards and so on of the, of the Cape. And then you got all those people who were the descendants of the Khoisan, the, what, whom they called the Hottentots at that time, and all the descendants of people who were either children of love between the races or children of rape between the races. All of those people were grouped under the category colored, separate. And then because Mr. Gandhi was making too much noise and Indians were not wanting to be repatriated and there were lots of movements there, then they constructed a category Indian. And since then, we've had this separation of colors with different administrations um, between those color groups or race groups or identity groups or whatever. Now, okay, that's the system. I said before, it involves a response, uh -uh. and it involves the work of the imagination. Why did the first people who, the, let's say, the parents of Mandela, just to make the story a bit more tangible, why did they say, uh uh, not native, African? We are Africans. It was the work of students again in those days. If you were clever in the colonies, you were sent to London or to the Tuskegee College in the US, or to Paris, you were in the Francophone Africa, or Lisbon, if you were uh, from the Portuguese colonies. And there, you met all kinds of other people from the African continent who were under the same conditions as you, speaking different languages, but everybody speaking the same English, or French, or Portuguese. And those started meeting a lot of the African-American ideas about Africa, the imagination of wanting to return back to Africa because slaves were homogenized, no matter where they came from, they were put together as slaves and they had to develop a new consciousness as African-Americans in the long term, but other derogatory terms in between. And they were dreaming of Africa there in those spaces and then this idea of Pan-Africanism of Africa emerged and everybody went back to the colonies and back to South Africa, those who went there, and decided we are an African people's movement. And that's how African National Congress, as opposed to Native Congress, so that was the no. And then the other thing, that the movements in India and South Africa shared, is that they were not just any kind of nationalism. 
You have varieties of nationalism possible. There were movements that promised a balance between freedom and equality. They were there in the project of those national movements to achieve some kind of freedom which arrives at a balance between freedom and equality. Now that might be the problem and the trouble. There are easier movements where you want to restore an ancient past and restore feudal relations and movements that bring back the king and bring back the queen and bring back the horses and bring back the elephants and bring back the giraffes and so on and have a restoration of the past. And there are movements that want to have, oops, want to have this search for a balance. And nobody's getting it right, this balance between freedom and equality, but at least the movements promised it. Okay, and that's what makes them different from other movements in the colonies. So, if that point is understood, then the generation of the parents of Mandela bequeathed to the next generation this idea of an African freedom, an inkululego, a kind of thing that would, in a sense, revalue the past, but create a better future. And the mobilization started, and the Second World War came, and, and the government promised them, if you come and fight, then we will give you your, your freedom. And they went and fought, and they didn't get their freedom, and nationalism started becoming a little bit more angry in all this. In this mobilization that was happening, the same time, Africana nationalism, that demanded strict separation of the races and whites to keep control of the country, started mobilizing and the apartheid government kicks Jan Smuts out in 1948 and apartheid as we know it comes into existence, 1948. Apartheid did not invent racism, racial domination, but it perfected it. It just kind of tied all the corners. Of course, this created militant opposition. This militant opposition created two movements at that time. On the one hand, there was the people who supported the Freedom Charter, and that brought together the African National Congress, the, Nat uh, the Natal and the Transvaal Indian Congresses, the Colored People's Congresses, the, uh, and, and so on. All the Congress traditions adopted the Freedom Charter, which argued that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, and therefore it was non-racial and therefore and therefore and we don't have time today to describe exactly what the Freedom Charter involved. And then there is the Pan-Africanist movement that develops out of that, that didn't like that. That said, uh-uh, Africa for the Africans. Pan-African idea and so on. Now, they weren't racist in that argument. Africans are those who accept African values and so on. So, these both movements started getting more and more militant. There were anti-pass campaigns, there were strikes, there were demonstrations, and then there was a crack, a crackdown from hell. And people were arrested, were detained, were tried, were sent to long terms in prison, people fled, went into exile, Mandela and others then decided to go the Bagat Singh way, pick up arms. You know, so therefore, form um conto where and start now an armed struggle. And he's arrested, and with African nationalism that wanted revolution and transformation. But afterwards came years of seeming quietitude. Nothing was happening, it seemed, until the late 1960s, things that were percolating and boiling started happening, and you see the emergence then of my generation, not Mandela's generation, but my generation. You see the emergence of black consciousness movement, of the United Democratic Front, of women's movements, of all kinds of movements, starting civil disobedience again. And then by 19, you know, so you, oh, sorry, and also one of the most militant trade union movements ever seen in the recent history emerges there. So these township, labor, youth, women, and so on struggles coalesce into major confrontations by the 1980s with the apartheid, um, with apartheid regime. And it gets into a situation where 
civil war is starting in certain areas and the bloodshed starts and you know you think when you're in there that there is no hope you know you're caught in a vicious circle of violence where neither the state can suppress the opposition and neither can the opposition shake the state out of its power the interesting thing though was the ability to shake the state came from high, a highly organized working class. Because once you're on the shop floor and you control 80% of the shop floors and you have democratic shop steward structures and people remove that leadership, you elect the next one, you elect the next one. And then the bosses start getting pissed off if you start taking too many workers away you know, from the shop floor. But anyway, that sustains a lot of the energy of what is going on. And by 1989, you don't know with another state of emergency, another situation, you heard the word emergency. If it comes, it's serious. You know it from earlier days. And people get picked up, don't know what's happening to people, people get disappeared and so on. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is still searching for people. But anyway, so 1989, you think there is no way forward and then starts a defiance campaign again, and all of a sudden, Mandela is released, and change starts happening. So we don't have time again to talk about what are the implications of these nationalisms once a negotiated settlement gets reached. What does it mean, this balance between equality and freedom? In our case, the compromise was, there were three compromises and a promise. The three compromise first about land. Land will not be considered for restitution before 1910, the formation of the Union of South Africa. This is a major concession because the mines and also all the colonized land can't be returned to the communities that lost them. Secondly, it's a compromise that government managements and labor form a tripartite thing so they can talk to each other instead of fighting each other. And then the third thing was a compromise between traditional authorities, chiefs, kings, and so on in the countryside, and urban modernists, that you will keep the customary areas under customary rule. And the promise is a reconstruction and development program that would bring about equality. There was no problem about freedom. The constitution that came was about total freedoms. At the moment, I can say anything I like, but that doesn't mean that my neighbors won't break my back but at least I won't get any formal sanction. So, nevertheless, these are the problems and the constraints that we encountered. And this search in South Africa for equality and freedom of this we, post-colonial society, is still searching for the ways through which a growing inequality in the world can be redressed or addressed and the tensions are many, and new movements are coming up, and it's complicated. But all I'm trying to say, though, is that looking at India, you know, from afar, we saw India as also the laboratory of the national question, your national question. We read extensively, uh, Tagore, Kamini Roy, who else did we read? We read Gandhi, we read Bhagat Singh, we, we learned about them, we learned about Nehru and Ambedkar, we learned all about all these tensions, EMS, everybody, including Gina and the RSS and so on. We, we learned and we saw this as India struggling to find itself in terms of this promise of creating a better society that balances freedom and equality. And you've got your constitution, we've got ours, they're very problematic, but I hope the JNU was the custodian of this national question, and that's why it was created. Still keeps the tradition of thinking. And we expect you to look at ours, look at our problems, what we write, what we achieve, what we fail at. We are horrible. We are, have got the diabolical ability to dream big and the diabolical kind of idiocy of destroying every dream the next day. So you can learn, you can unlearn things from that, from us. But we are in this process of trying to find this promise. And the new generation now, our children, Mandela's grandchildren, 
are exploding in South Africa. There's fees must fall, roads must fall, trade unions are breaking out, and new trade union formations are being created, new conflicts. But it's all a search of trying to find this sometimes arbitrary geographical space to give it a meaning, to give it a purpose, to give it dignity, to redress gender imbalances, to redress voice imbalances, to redress value imbalances in order to achieve a better society that is looks after its people and freedom is not a constitution and the day when it's declared it's a process a long process of all of us and each of us removing removing the constraints that keep us unfree helping each other remove the constraints we don't want to be the same all of us to be the same we want to help each other remove those constraints, provided that equity comes with it. So, I thank you for your generosity. I thank you for your ears. I will stop here. I'll be around for this semester. If we don't want encounters, I'll be here. Thank you. was requested to do poetry uh, English when when we are back in peace and so on the English department is going to host a poetry uh, event but I might come one of the gatherings ready for that I'm a bit tired now to do poetry thank you <coughs> questions or... any questions comments welcome